six inches or so to try and fit a coil over in. Yeah. So we just went, well, we'll have to go to inboard suspension. Um, so that's that's the reason for that. What do you get if you cross a classic Mini with a GT3 race car? We're here with Jason to talk about what is perhaps the wildest Mini I've ever seen. Can we just start off by understanding what your concept was behind this? What are you building this for? Like, what application? The car started out as purely a fast road car. And like all good builds, just morphed from one thing to the next to the next. Snowball. Yeah. Snowballed, ideas, different people getting involved. And it really came down to the probably the, the electronics package is what dictated where we got to from here. We decided to do certain things that were different. The, the Bosch Motorsport ABS just tweaked it. And I just went, if we're going to put ABS in this thing, it has to be off its tits and just do something that no one's ever seen before. We didn't really build it for... A particular class of racing but i would love one day to be able to bump doors with someone i don't know with what class of racing that ever let me in yeah but the main thing was just to make something that is fast and no one had really done before yeah. i mean a build for the purpose of just making what you want is, is yes. perfect enough so walking up to this from the back i went well that looks crazy i'm going to probably walk around to the front and see a honda v series or something like that but Pleasantly surprised, but also confused. I didn't really know what I was looking at. Can you just explain what the engine setup is in the front? The classic part or the DNA of the car had to remain a Mini. You know, I toyed with over the time, putting a B-Series in a car and doing all those sorts of things. But when it came back to it, my heart said, it has to still be a Mini. So I wanted it to remain a Mini. It had to have the A-Series and it had to, have a, had to be a steel body and it had to be the proper a proper mini it couldn't be a tube car with a fiberglass body and a rover v8 it couldn't be that it had to be an a series so going down that path we looked around and looked for what is the best version of an a series at the time and that was to put a twin cam head on it then when i started looking around i actually came across a motor and head package that was was actually available for sale um so we decided to buy that and then, again, we wanted to pair it, uh, pair it back with an actual A-Series gearbox as well. So it's got a dog engagement, straight catch, um, four-speed gearbox in it. Just like grandma's car, but it certainly whines. Predominantly A-Series still. Can we just talk maybe back about like the original A-Series head and the architecture yep. of that and what the limitation is? Yeah, so the original A-Series head is uh, it's what they call a five-port head. So and it's and it's not a cross flow. Um, so you end up with Siamese ports for in, inlet. You get two inlet ports which feed four cylinders, and then you get three exhaust ports for four cylinders. Yeah. Very limiting from the point of view that there's not you could try and flow the hell out of that thing and it's not going to flow very well. You're then also limited with the fact that it's you know it's only eight valves, two valves per cylinder, and can like a push rod cam setup. So. Going to the, the Kent version, we basically go to twin overhead cam, 16 valves, the ability to get that head to flow and also inlet as well because you're now a cross flow situation, you can do a lot more with the inlet side of things. Yeah. yeah. So basically bringing it up to essentially like what a modern conventional cylinder head design would be. Very much so. And But even then, um, even when, when we went down this path, the the Kent version of, of the engine was a was a lost spark fuel injection. Yeah. Terrible. So we had to come up with, we had to put a cam position, so it came with a crank position sensor, but then you had lost spark fuel injection. So then we had to come up with a cam position sensor and so we could get full multi, multi-point multi fuel injection yeah. and, and get the tunability out of it that we wanted. Right. So do you have like a crank sensor for general trigger and then a cam for cam phasing? Yeah. Yes. So, yep. yeah, um, sequential injection and, and proper... Yep, um, yeah, proper tunability. Yeah, yeah yep. awesome. In terms of engine management, what, what are you running in terms of the electronics in the car? Everything in the car is Bosch. Yeah, well... Absolutely everything. Bosch ECU, we're Bosch running a Bosch PDM, running a Bosch Dash, and, of course, the crowning jewel was the Bosch Motorsport ABS. So everything in the car is, is, is Bosch. So in terms of running the uh, Bosch ABS in the car, you're going to need wheel speed sensors and yep. so on. All done. Um, yeah, we'll get onto the suspension a little bit more in just a moment, but is that just something that was basically retrofitted, retrofitted. to the standard hubs? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it was retrofitted. So we, we 
we machined all that up and, and had all that done um, and then had to make mounting points for the sensors and everything. But we've, we've, we've been able to do all of that. And that's all in place. So, all right, the, one of the most eye-catching things, I think, poking through the rear, rear window here and in the engine bay is uh, the cantilevers, the su- suspension. And then also looking down at some of the um, A-arms and stuff, it all looks a little bit custom. Can you just explain what's going on there? What prompted all of that as well? Uh, what were the major changes and, and the need to go cantilever if there was one? Yeah. The major reason we went cantilever was the physical space available in the car. So what we've done is everything's been shifted upwards into the car and to lower the body down. So once we moved everything up 50 mil, it only left us six inches or so to try and fit a coilover in. Yeah. So we just went, well, we'll have to go to inboard suspension. But the other reason was anything available for a Mini is just not really performance related. So by going to inboard, it left us, gave us a lot more scope in what we could do. And it also gave us a lot more scope into trying to get tunability into the shock absorber by going with the cantilever with the with the bell crank yeah. and going to a two to one. We can turn 30 mil into 60 mil. The original spring setup in this car is quite unique. So maybe could you just explain that really quick yeah. so people understand how far ahead this setup is. Yeah. So the original mini suspension is, uses what they call a rubber cone system. So what it is, it's basically like a, a rubber cone a rubber ball with a cone on it that connects to the suspension and you're compressing that ball as the spring and then you're using a damper, shock absorber, just to, to dampen all that. It's a massive step in the right direction. Massive step. Although at the same time, we've maintained a lot of the original pickup points. Yeah. Okay. Part of wanting it to be a Mini, um, Minis handle really well out of the box. Um, so part of it has been... We don't really need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to take the wheel and turn it from a wooden spoke wheel to a magnesium alloy. (laughs) That's and that's all we've tried to do. And the upright and everything is still the original stuff. Original upright, yes. So we're still running the original upright. Looks a bit different. It's an alloy upright, so we've used uh, an aftermarket alloy upright, and we're running KAD six six pop brakes on the front. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So should pull it up pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Get a few figures behind things. The horsepower, the weight. Okay. Generally, a good built KAD engine should pull you somewhere between 150 and 200 horsepower. We're running 1430 as a displacement, which is a fair pickup over the 1275 from original. We're running the K- uh, like the, the larger version of the KAD head as far as valves and cam is concerned. The head has been modified and flowed by Jake Bain from Bain Racing. And anyone in the, especially the drag racing or the motorsport industry knows Jake Bain and they call him the little professor. Um, that guy spews flow rates and flow dynamics and everything else and he just does his thing. So between the combination that we've got and the fact that we've, we, I'm super confident with what Jake's done to the head, I think we'll be pulling 200 horsepower quite easily, especially with the, those engines that I was talking about with like around 180 horsepower were lost spark engines as well. So we've got our custom um, intake manifold, all of that's been done. It's all been, all the runners and everything have been designed and, and built to suit the car. So we're thinking that if we don't pull 200 horsepower, we'll be very disappointed. As far as weight is concerned, it came in at 610. Wow, yeah. Yeah, so 610 was, was the number. I mean, anything over... 100 horsepower is going to be a lot of fun. And then... Yeah, so 600, 600 at 200, that's something like 380 horsepower to the ton. Yeah. Um, so it's not bad. Yeah. Pretty potent, yeah. But that's the starting point, and we will be doing another engine build package by the time we get back here for next year. Yeah, awesome. Well, cool. Thanks for giving us some insight into it. It's a, definitely an interesting one and a little bit different to what we usually see anyway. So yeah. if anyone wants to follow along with what you're doing with it as you get it running and start testing it, where are they best to do so? Uh, the best to do that on Warhorse Motorsports. Okay. So yeah, so Instagram with Warhorse Motorsports. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for your time. All right. Thank you. Cheers.